Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Got an exciting podcast for you today. We're going to do an interview with someone that we will identify as Jill, and that's a pseudonym. We want to let her maintain her anonymity as well as the anonymity of all the people involved. So whenever names are said, they are not the actual name. And as we do always, let's go right into prayer. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come before you, come before your people, to reveal the works of darkness and to bring them out into the light. Praise the Lord. I praise you, Father God, that we have this chance to show the strategies and the tactics of the enemy and how the enemy operates in people's lives, how he's operated in our lives, and to reveal it so that we can break free of the pattern that we've been in, that so many of us have been in with regard to the Jezebel and the narcissistic spirit and how it's uh, controlled many of our lives for long swaths and periods of time. And I just praise you that that is coming to an end in so many people's lives. I praise you and thank you that we are getting free of this Jezebel narcissistic spirit so that we can serve you and you alone. You are the only one we want to serve. And in Jesus' mighty name, I come against every demonic spirit that would cause any um, delusion or deception in me, in Jill, in anyone else that may be listening to this message. I come against delusion because we've been deluded for so long by this spirit. I bind up deception. I command it to leave each and every one of us. I bind up the perversities and the the sexual lusts and lasciviousness of the Jezebel spirit. Come against that, bind it up, rebuke it, command it to leave every listener as well as Jill and myself. This spirit, you can no longer have power over us. Everybody that has a will to get free of this spirit is against you, and we bind you up, we rebuke you, and command you to leave each and every one of us, and to also leave the people in our lives who we are praying for to get deliverance, for our, not only for ourselves, but for the narcissists and the Jezebels that we deal with on a day-to-day basis. We come against their spirits, we come against their witchcraft, their spells that have come against us to try to destroy us, not just diminish us, but to destroy. For the devil has come to rob, kill, and destroy And we rebuke that. We return all that to sender. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And Father God, I just praise you and thank you for this interview. Let flesh not speak. Let let your spirit with our spirit speak truth that ministers light and truth and deliverance to each and every listener in Jesus' mighty name. And I kind of want to start today's uh, podcast. Praise God. Thanks, Jill. But I want to start this podcast before we even begin the interview, just with a quick reading from Scripture. It's Proverbs chapter 7. It says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner." So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry and and carved works with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech she caused him to yield, with a flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as the fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, ye children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. 
Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And the reason why I wanted to introduce this um, proverb is to emphasize the point that was said in the prayer, that the, the objective of this seductive Jezebel spirit is our deaths. The objective of the narcissistic spirit is the death of the person it's attacking. It wants to rob, kill, and destroy like every demon does. And it's a very powerful demon to do that using seduction, as we've shown many times from the verse in Revelation 2.20, which says that Jezebel has come to seduce God's servants to fornication and to eat things committed to idols. So I think that's a good starting point, Jill, for your testimony and all the things that, that's happened. First of all, how are you doing? I'm doing real well. Yeah, that's, that's, really, uh, that's really good because uh, sin, I mean, I think that's one of the main objectives, as you said, is that this spirit wants to bring others to sin. It, it, it in itself is very much, uh, very, well, you're very well versed in the language of sin, but it, it uses sin uh, and sinning to appear seductive and to entice others um, to partake in it leading them to believe that there are no moral or spiritual consequences to it. But yes, that's, that, that was really nice. That's right. You know, yeah. that's the big thing about, like you say, any spirit is to gain entrance into our lives. We have to voluntarily allow them, and the, the way to do it is through, like you're saying, sin. And the funny thing about that is that once we do that sin, we give them a foothold and a, and a space in our soul realms and even our spirits, spirit realms, and that's how we end up possessed. So the devil will use seduction to do it. And it's not just through women. You know, this Jezebel spirit operates in men through two narcissistic spirits that seduce women to this same trap and use, uses women and doesn't care or value the woman in the same way the Jezebel spirit doesn't uh, care about or value the man or men in the life of the Jezebel. Yes, it's, uh, I find that it's more prevalent so far anyway in my research in women. However, I have also come uh, across men that are possessed by it. So, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, it's a lose-lose situation because it's not just the person that's involved with a Jezebel spirit who is out to kill him, and that's really important. But uh, also the spirit hates the person that it, is embodying so they will never get any peace or rest either that's right the delusion being however that they feel that their actions uh, are, are correct and that they're behaving in a correct manner and that's the, that's the scariest and that's the, you know the most dangerous thing because then you're never open to looking somewhere else for any help that's right or to make any changes as that's a matter of fact i think the spirit attaches itself quite nicely to other who are pers- uh, under the influence, so that um, you get a nice like little ring of people doing the, doing those things. Right, and they create enablers too, Ahab type spirits, people that enable yeah. them, and and uh, I c- could call them their fan club. They love fan club members that that support them in their wrongdoing. Yes, and as a friend pointed out, that uh, the spirit has a lot of friends in love places. <laughs> it's not just a country song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do have, uh, you know, I'm a third generation Jezebel. I mean, it could have been more, but those are the only ones that I know about. Uh, it never fit me. I feel that uh, I always uh, long for a, a difference. Sinless life, so I've had issues with it. It never quite um, gelled with my personality, let's just say. Uh, it was through some personal experiences and through some suffering, which, you know, is a great way to come to Jesus, that I I was brought to that point. Well, tell, I, I tell us about I, your experience with living in a household where you were exposed to the Jezebel spirit on a day-to-day basis. What was that like? Well, we have to remember that this spirit uh, ultimately is, is, is a spirit that thrives on a perpetual state of, of misery and strife, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, uh, 
it's never, uh, there's never any peace. Now, my Jezebel, the, the problem, of course, being that there's no one to turn to. Um, my Isolation. parents divorced when I was quite young, so I didn't have anyone to go to that could uh, let me know otherwise. The, um, the sin that my mother was partaking in, she was more than happy to pass on to, um, to her daughter and uh, encouraged her and saw nothing wrong with it. And when I would bring, you know, victims around and say, oh, you know, this guy is, uh, <laughs> he's really upset that I'm doing his life. And she would say, well, that's just, what's wrong with him? But he didn't know. So it was, it was, um, you know, what she said at the intro is what's, what's very important to me right now is that you, you're being deceived. This spirit is deceptive and that I gave unwillingly. It stole uh, a, a good 25 years of my life. And even though it might appear that you're just having this great time doing what you want type of thing, you're very, very unhappy. And, and looking back... Uh, it's just a wasted, well, actually it's in my checklist I can go to, but it's, it's, it's uh, wasting your resources and potential and talent for anything that might be fruitful in your life. Like you said, it's, it's not there to give you those things, and it doesn't love you. It, it, it wants to kill those around you, and uh, it wants to, I mean, eventually it's going to get you. you know? That's right, that's right. Hopefully you'll to Jesus beforehand and will be able to point these things out. And, you know, I, what I want to say also is how easy and how quickly one can be uh, free of the scenarios of this horrific experience. Absolutely, and I definitely want to address that. Certainly by the end of this, we, we want to provide hope to the listener through your testimony and yes. through any testimony that there is freedom, even for people that operate in the Jezebel spirit. A lot of people think that narcissists and Jezebels can never be set free, and I just I just disagree with that. I mean, I know it seems like it's a rarity, but, I mean, anybody can be born again, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take Damascus Road-type experiences for a lot of people to get set free and delivered, And it's but it's not going to happen without Jesus, His Word, and casting that demon out, we have to begin to take right. up our weapons of warfare and cast these yeah. demons out through deliverance. Like it says in Mark 16, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. And when we appropriate that power, I'm just a believer that 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 demon, that Jezebel's demon is very high up on the hierarchy in terms of its power. But, you know, there's no demon, no even Satan himself. Jesus said he's given us power over all the power of the enemy and that nothing by any means would hurt us. We've been given power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all their power. And that includes him. You know, he's the strongest, obviously, and the rest are his minions. And and this Jezebel demon, very, while yeah, strong, we should, strong, we should, we can cast it out. It, but the person that it's indwelling needs to be willing, obviously. They have to come out of their deception. But Now, you have an awesome list that I am dying to hear if you would present that to us about the characteristics and traits of the Jezebel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to begin with, you know, like I said, someone that wants to bring you to sin, or if you find that yourself, are more than eager to purchase drugs and share them with everyone, you know, without thinking about it. Mm. Uh, sin is a big one, you know. The, the misery that I was talking about in my own childhood and the strife, people that are always uh, caught up in these situations. We have to remember that, um, that even when, when uh, they, these people appear happy, they're, it's just an outward image because, well, you're, 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 you're dying on the inside, so there's no way that you could be genuinely happy. Right. It's this outgoing, generous, fun, happy-go-lucky image is just that because really what they carry about them is an atmosphere of heaviness and and oppression and and for me one of the things that i i didn't recognize because i hadn't i had never been at these was when i was delivered uh, to just just a couple months after that i was taking out some trash one morning and i thought what i felt uh, i felt peculiar and i realized that 
I wasn't angry at anyone or anything, and it had been wow. so long that I, I was unable to recognize peace. I didn't know what that felt like, and I loved it. Wow. But, uh, what an epiphany. Yeah, because, you know, that's a big thing of the Jezebel, and those who are involved in a relationship with someone who wakes up, and it's, you know, it's every morning. There might be a few moments of, you know, hey, good morning, but then it's going to go into, yeah, I can't believe that person said that, you know, I can't oh, believe that. The resentments. Well, why would they do that to me? Resentments, Sorry. sort of resentments. Uh, resentment is huge. The inconsistency and in uh, uh, predictability, and I think that you said that was part of what you said there in the beginning. You know, changeable, someone whose mood changes because um, even, you know, if someone is not a nice person, at least if they're consistent about it, you kind of know how to, you know, work around that in their presence. Right. It's the inconsistency that starts to eat at the person because you let your guard down and you think, well, you know, um, she was just in a bad mood or he wasn't feeling well, you know, things that, that's over with. And then uh, you'll meet up or see that person and uh, you'll be attacked and you won't be expecting it and it will right. really, really the the, vic yeah, yeah. the victim just is always on his or her heels and, and doesn't know how to respond. But I want to address something that you said at the beginning in your first part of the list. You talked about wanting to draw others to sin, and you said you made reference to the idea that um, you know that he would the narc jazz would be the person to buy all the drugs and get everybody to do it, or or maybe have the big party and provide everybody with alcohol and want them to drink and get drunk and just take things to another level sin wise. Um, are there other other ways that that come to mind for you that you've experienced that where you've seen people pull the trigger wanting to sin? I guess you know sexually we could obviously go there. We don't want to go too too descriptive, but if you know what I mean. I love that for the very end because that's really you know quite quite. Okay. Important. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll be careful with that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's continue your list. Um. You, you said it right before uh, we went to this. This was the uh, the victim mindset. Uh. They foster a victim mindset. Now they will not admit to that. Right. Uh, you know, but they complain. These are the people that are going to be complaining about their spouses. Right. Uh, that's one of the ways that I recognize what was going on in my own life was because after you know my father and stepfather passed away who had been, who, you know, my Jezebel had been complaining and complaining for years and years and years about, uh, I thought that these men were, were, you know, how unfortunate that she had married these horrific men, but after they passed away and the complaining start, did not stop and reached on now to other members of the family was when I had to kind of stop and, and uh, take that in and say, well, that just can't be. So there, there is this constant complaining, and they'll complain about, they're the people that, you know, their neighbors are usually, oh, they're having issues with their neighbors, you know, that the clerk at the store was rude to them, the sales lady or that car mechanic did them wrong, or how dare they speak to them this way or that way. Um, you know, this spirit is all about being praised, and the moment that someone else doesn't do that, there's going to be, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to issues, and, and they're very good at complaining. They're masters at, at it, and, you know, they'll complain about someone, only to call that person and complain about someone else. You know, it's just right. It's, it's, uh, but if you're a person that's living in that environment, you know, you're not the, you're not the mechanic being claimed, uh, complained about that can just live his life and not have to worry about putting up with it. But if you live with that person and you're the subject of it, like the spouse that has to live with the narc jazz constantly uh, uh, acting like a victim, like they're the ones being hurt when in fact they're the ones doing all the damage to their spouse and, and claiming that the spouse they're hurting is doing the damage to them. And it's, it's just, everything is, is on its head. There's, it, it lacks all reason. It doesn't, well, yes, and I think that's one of the main reasons that a lot of their spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, etc., will turn to um, vices to cope. Right. Because, of course, yes, you know, I've seen that firsthand. Um, I mean, I think my stepdad just wanted to chill out and watch television or, you know, sit in the backyard and look at some squirrels, but of course, you know, 
she's like, well, why are you putting your feet on the coffee table? Mm-hmm. Oh, you, I'm just going to sit there. You're not going to do the dishes? You know, no. <laughs> and then they do have that, you know, when they speak on the phone to, or they're complaining on the phone, they tend to do it loudly and walk around. Uh... So it's not... Right. So they're not going to be in some little corner, you know, talking to whoever they're talking to. They're going to be walking because they, they, they want to be heard. So I did... Uh, it's a form of yeah. manipulation, isn't it? Of course it is. And and what I wanted to also mention is that when they're made friends, those that you know, have to be around the spirit and turn to drugs, turn to drinking, to just cope. I mean, I, I always wondered, why would I drink? I would, I would meet up with this Jezebel and I immediately wanted a drink. Right. Um, but what happened then is that it just gets them you know, one more pull in their arsenal of, well, look at you. You can't keep it together. You're so weak. <laughs> Did you really need that? Oh, that's so sad. Right. So um, it's... I'm laughing, but I, I shouldn't. I should be. I shouldn't be laughing. This is a horrible, a horrible thing. But it just the way you're saying it sounds funny. It's just, it's a terrible. It's a terrible catch twenty. Well, what's the word? Like a double bind. Yeah. You're damned. I don't like using this word, but you're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't with them. If exactly. You, if you do something nice for them, they're going to complain about it, and they're going to think you're weak for doing something nice for them and punish you for it. If you don't do something nice, they'll complain about that, and then it's just a, it's a, it's a vicious cycle of abuse. Yeah, well, you know, um, this spirit itself knows no peace. So if you don't know something, you're not going to be able to give it to another person. So there's no way that you can create a peaceful home if you yourself are internal, you know. Um, Like I said, for me, it was one of the, you know, when I gave my life over to Jesus, that was, it was it was so peculiar. I didn't understand what was happening. I loved it, uh, you know, but the problem, you know, I, I, I went to the New Age movement for, for a long time, and I think it's kind of a, a natural extension from Jezebel because it's so well-versed with witchcraft, you know, to begin with, so you're, you're happy to do that. But, you know, in the New Age movement, we're told, oh, you know, you're, you've got to wake up. You need to be happy, 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 happy. So to wake up and to not have that experience uh, was, uh, you know, that peace, again, was just very foreign and very, very welcome. And I thank Jesus every single day Amen. for allowing to experience that. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Jezebel, I think that what's really important for people to know, or, or to, you know, this is something that's the true point to that person, is they, they hate it, hate it when their authority is questioned. Oh. Uh. Uh, they like to think Why do they have to thing. control so much? Do you think what what is that about? If it's, I mean, we know it's demonic, but what do what do they feel inside that makes them have to control one hundred percent of the time, where they can't compromise or or or, or gain, give over control in any way to the to the other person in the relationship? Uh, well, you know, you've got to remember that control is. Uh, I mean, it's a sin. You know, we're here to have free will, and it's robbing that person of their free will. It's this assumption that they know best for everything and everyone, you know. Right. Um, They, I mean, the fact that, um, you know, even when these people are guilty of something, they will not admit their guilt. You cannot get them to admit that. Uh, They might just temporarily, but it's only to win favor with someone. Right. Because really to accept responsibility for their actions would violate um, this core of insecurity and pride, right. you know, from which the spirit operates. So insecurity and, and rejection are somewhere at the root of why they're, they, they've allowed the spirit, why they, you know, they work with it or allowed them into their life. Um, you know, another way to really kind of make note of if, if you're if you're if you're arguing or trying to explain your point with someone, and they are all over the place, they refuse to to stick with that point. They'll uh, they know how to push buttons, you know, and right. they all they they are always innocent, and they they're the kind of person that will create a horrific scene and then kind of sit back and say, why did what did I do? Why are you asking? Like, right. With you. Right. They'll change the playing field and constantly and shift the argument, especially if if your logic is actually 
is winning the argument, they have to shift it so that you can't actually in, insert real yeah. logic or reason into the argument. No, That's for sure. They're not interested in your logic. They're interested in being right. They lie. That's right. the other thing. This spirit lies, 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 <laughs> lies. I believe that they're compulsive liars. Right. And I believe that a lot of them may not even really even have the ability anymore to recognize uh, the difference between the truth and the lie. You know, they they don't want to listen to anyone's logic. And, and uh, but one of the ways they get out of that is they talk in confusion. You know, um, the spirit um, doesn't want to be exposed. Right. Okay, they want you mad at the person because they hate the person too. It's not like they love this person. That's what a lot of people don't realize. Um, you know, they, they, they're, not, they're not doing anyone any favors, you know. So they love confusion. They, they will not be discovered or unexposed, which is why they don't want to hear logic. They will talk nonsense to just draw you in. Right. And they will work you up. They will confuse you. And basically, they will never... In my experience, ever respond to a direct question with a direct answer, you know? You know, it's um, funny that you mentioned that, as I've noticed in some of my personal anecdotal experiences, is that they, back to the idea, they like to stir you up and get you upset with lack of reason. And it's funny how it seems, I've seen where getting poked at by them, more than one of them, when they'll poke at you and poke at you and they really love the to see you snap that they 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 enjoy it they they want to hear you curse and and use bad language and and take it to another level i'm not condoning that with anybody don't let them draw you there is what i'm saying but you be be wary of this tactic but it just seems like they get a perverse enjoyment out of fighting and and the other party being upset it's almost like once they get you there they actually relax a little bit and they're having fun have you noticed that yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Interesting that you said that because one of the questions that I always had was, why are you going, or you know, after this individual who's doing nothing except sitting here and eating squirrels? I mean, you know. But I think they are so angry at the person who can experience uh, the right. moments of peace. And right. yes, exactly what she said. Why aren't you arguing with a lady across the street who's? saying this and that to you, but you're thinking at this person who's just sitting here, you know, looking at the trees or whatever, uh, but, but I have That's that. the you're jealousy right. and the oh. envy, like you say, the jealousy and the envy of the person that is, that does have peace. They're so, in, they're so pissed off that, that they, they are, got it. They are. That seems to really set them off. I have seen them walk up to someone, like I said, who's just sitting there and talk about how, you know, why are you wearing these shoes? They're dirty. I told you to get rid of them. You're tracking mud all over the house. And literally, this person has done nothing. Uh, so that's a really good point. And I think that if that's happening to you, uh, you should be you should pay attention and, and listen to some of these yeah, things. It's, because, funny, um, it's funny you mentioned that about the like dirty... The, very dark here. It, you're right, exactly. And it's funny you mentioned that about the dirty shoes. I, I've got two kind of yeah. anecdotal points, points about that, about the control issue. With uh, The first yeah. thing I want to say is about they're so controlling that if, say you're washing the dishes... You have to wash, you have your method of washing the dishes, whatever it may be, using a sponge or a brush or the dishwashing detergent, whatever, but you're on way. In the end, it's the same result. The dishes are clean, but if you don't do it their way, I mean, they'll nitpick about stuff that's so minor and, and doesn't matter. Oh yeah. And, 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 you know, imagine growing up in a household like that where, you're, you're you just know, on well, edge no all the ever time. No helps me with anything, and then everyone just kind of stops what they're doing because they don't want to hear it and immediately starts cleaning. And then it's, oh, well, if you're going to do it like that, really, just don't even bother. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to do it. You know? is, I mean, have you noticed that they're all, that, that, that most Jezebels and narcissists are hyper, hyper clean in their houses and their cars, their, and about themselves, they make themselves look very clean and presentable and their clothing's always top notch. What do you think about that? Well, I think it, it's an exterior. Uh, I think that if you open up the drawers in that person's ultra clean house, you're going to see quite a mess. If you look in the closet, I think there's one very, very much like the spirit itself. Um, uh, 
But maybe it's more like what Jesus said when he was, Jesus said, uh, talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, you make the outward of the cup and platter very clean, but inside you're full of wickedness and excess. And, you know, even if they have every part of their house clean, I think they're trying to compensate for what's inside of them. Absolutely. And I, I, in, in the, in the, very di- distant past, I did some uh, interior design work, and I worked for uh, a lot of um, very, very wealthy women who, uh, you know, the Jezebel spirit seems to do really, really well with. And I saw firsthand some of, you know, what the, tr- the trauma that they caused to their families. Wow. But uh, it was a lot of, you know, and I think that has a lot to do with why they're always getting. Um, plastic surgery Mm -hmm. or they're you know spending a lot of the women spend a lot of money on makeup and hair because these appearances um are covering up you know and i I think that somewhere inside of them is a very scared little girl or boy right and that they will go to great lengths to um Maybe it's their way of recreating that person into what they consider as success. You know, what society tells us is about about success. You know, that's right. But, um, yeah, the I whole. Mean, the, and I, don't, I was just saying the whole of society is set up to, especially in American society, is set up to make people Jezebels and make them concerned about outward appearance and keeping up with the Joneses and that sort of thing. Well, that's, why it's very difficult for someone that's involved with the Jezebel because you, you really do feel that the world is against you because the media supports their point of view right. and spreading, you know, to other cultures. So you really do feel that, um, you know, there's something wrong with you. I mean, come on, you know, uh, look at everyone around you. And you've said, you've said it before, these, you know, on television, these shows that show this, you know, ineffectual man and these powerful women. So, what, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you having an issue with it? And it's celebrated. I mean, these reality housewife things are just the most, that's just horrific, you know, these vapid women um, who are just presented to us as the end all and, you know, the new face of uh, celebrity and what everybody wants to aspire to. But I can't imagine that being married to such a woman would bring fulfillment to mm-hmm. any man or you know if that's your mother I, I don't know how, how what kind of mother is that Joe well, let me ask you your uh, opinion on something you know thinking about the roles of men and women in you know in the household and you know the biblical perspective that the man Christ is the head of the man the man's head of the woman can can that biblical model work in a way that the woman actually feels free. And how? what does that look like to you, that where the woman can actually be herself and have a supportive husband and support her husband? What does that look like to you? I, I, uh, I'm very, very good with that, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I clashed with my Jezebel parent, because I, you know, when you are loved and guided by someone who is godly, like my father was, there is freedom in that, and there's also security and a sense of protection that the world doesn't want you to experience. Uh. Um, you know what, I, it's kind of like this, a few years back I had uh, I did a liver one, and I went to a doctor and she said, well, you know, you can eat this and this and that, and you can't drink this and you can't drink that, but you can have a little potato vodka, whatever, you know, there was a guideline. And I remember the first time I left her office and went into a restaurant and looked at this vast menu of options. You know, it was one of these places that had everything 24 hours a day, which you know, to me was an analogy of the world we were living in. And within this, you know, all these unbelievable options, I now was allowed five or six things, all of which I liked very much. And... um which I knew ultimately were going to be benefiting my health. And it was wonderful. I even remember calling someone and saying, wow, this is incredible. And and she had commented on how freeing that must have felt. And I thought, you're right. And, you know, the irony in looking at this menu that had over 100 items and choosing five of them and feeling really great about it, 
and not lacking anything. This right. is how I see what you've just posed. Right. You know, we told that, oh, well, you can choose anything. You can be anything. You can do any kind of drug. You can sleep with any kind of man or woman, you know. And, um, but if it's, 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 if it's detrimental to your well-being and, and, you know, you're waking up with hangovers and you can't accomplish anything and, and then you get depressed because of what, of these actions, you know, and then you don't have anyone to turn to. And I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's what Jesus has done for me, you know, right. he's, and, 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 you know, he's, um, given me that father because you know, my father passed away, unfortunately, mm. but I feel that now, and I personally love it, and I think a lot of women would do really, really well with it. I think ultimately that's what we're looking for anyway, is someone that loves us unconditionally, and that, you know, will step in in a really loving way, because they're being guided by love, right. and say, you know what, honey, maybe you don't want to do that, you know, maybe you want to think twice about, you know, going over here and spending all night doing drugs or whatever, because, you know, we could go and have do a wonderful thing Sunday, but you're not going to feel off to it, and you're going to miss out. Um, and it's not until, you know, for me. How do you think a you Jezebel can, reacts to the way a husband would try to lovingly uh, guide? What, what's her initial reaction? No, 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 no. <laughs> Run and hide, people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, first of all, I mean, Jezebel hates no. You know, the word no is something that you do not tell a Jezebel. But you got to remember that this spirit is, is uh, power hungry, right. and it's all about self-worship. Right. So they will go, they're ready to do battle, you know, uh, and attacking their mates. Oh, is, uh, I don't I think a few things please this, this spirit more, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, attacking a strong man or a good man is uh, one of the big ways that, mm. I mean, I don't know, they get off that way, you know. They, um, Does it make, it makes them feel more powerful when they can manipulate their husband or their man that's a, that you said is a strong, caring man? They feel like they get control, or what's what's that like for them? Well, you know, going back to, um, I, you know, <laughs> their main objective being to emasculate, you know, their, 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 their male. Right. When a man is seduced by the spirit, you know, I guess we'll go to the sexual part right now. Because that's that's where, you know, they come in. And well, and well let me ask you them. one side question before we go to the sexual part. Like, when well, you said you, you were bringing up the emasculation of the male and making, you know, making the man to really take on the, the role of being subject to the woman. But when a Jezebel does that, she can, she's, let me ask you, she's probably drawn to a strong man because he wants to have the natural order of things and be the leader. She likes that. She's very attracted to it. But when she gets it, that demon in her makes her objective to cut that man down like a tree. And once he gets down she won't be attracted to him anymore and will have lost all respect for him. Isn't that right? Or how does that work? Um, yes, I believe that all those, you know, again, once again, you know, we've got like a, um, uh, an outline of, I believe that Jezebel is, is a lot like people, you know, some might be more drawn to one aspect of this demon, and that's what it is, than others. So it's not going to be exactly all of them are the same. I do believe they're attracted to powerful men. I don't believe they always marry powerful men because they may feel that they won't be able to control them. Once again, going back to appearances, uh. I believe that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more fun, or I don't know if it's fun for them or if it's just their modus operandi to take a man and, and uh, uh, through, you know, constant bickering and complaining, reduce them to, you know, a form of shell of themselves, which is what happens to them. Right. And then use that in front of your friends and children to kind of say, you know, like, how can you listen to him? Look at him. Right. You know, like, good, he can barely get out of the sofa, or he can hardly stop drinking or smoking mm. pot or whatever the poor man has turned to, to cope, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then... Instead of to God. Becomes, 
the, the you know, they create that, that order out of chaos. They, they create these situations so that they can swoop in and appear like the hero. Oh. Because here they are to say, let me save you from this man that has been reduced to this ineffectual father who can barely, you know, get out of bed in the morning. And now, you know, you look and think, oh, wow, thank, you know, thank heavens that we have mom because, you know, he's, he's just a mess. Well, wow. I mean, who, who, who made him that way, you know? Who, and, who drove him to that, you know? And during this process, she's probably no longer attracted to him physically, and is, that's where the adultery aspect of it probably comes out, where her eyes are looking at stronger men and probably emasculating him by drawing comparisons to these men that she's uh, secretly attracted to and possibly cheating with. Yeah, you're, you're, you, you want to go there, don't you? All right. Let's, let's do it. Let's go. We've got to go there. It's in Revelation 2.20. We've got to go there. <laughs> I think we're going to have to go there. Look, it's a good um, segue. You know, this turn is, is, is a great seductress. You know, uh, and I was listening to what you were reading about... Um, the, the, the tapestry, you know, and the sheets being so, uh, to the extent of, I mean, my <laughs> grandmother would plant night-blooming jasmine outside her house because, you know, I thought it was just because it smelled nice, but it might have been, but I remember her telling me one day, yes, you know, and, you know, if I have a man coming over at night, you know, he's going to just feel that even get before he gets inside her house, she's already using flowers. To, you know, and I mean, that's such a wonderful like, that's such a wonderful smell. I mean, that's one of the best smells aside from honeysuckle the world has to offer. Uh, it's it's an amazingly wonderful smell, and it's wonderful to plant it because you love it and want other people to uh, to experience it. But when you're using it as part of your net of seduction, right. knowing full well that someone's self senses are now going to be manipulated and mm. altered before they even make it inside your house, your tapestries and sheets and etc. Uh, then you're looking at something else. You know? That's a you're type of witchcraft, isn't it? It's a type of spell casting. Exactly. A level of, you know, this is the great seductress. I always tell people that, you know, especially men, that they may feel that, you know, he's hit the jackpot, so to speak, when you know, he first is with this woman, but uh, that uh, she's more interested in the act rather than the man that she's involved with. You know, Jezebel is not interested in, in, in his opinion. She's not interested in your desires or your interests. She will. She's very happy to take the money. She's more interested in the man's body parts, and, and most importantly, she's interested in their complete submission. Your job, if you're going out with this. Spirit is to praise her, to worship, to praise her, and to please her, and of course that includes sexually. That is uh, of great importance, and really any deviation from that script will have dire consequences for for, for the offender, wow. uh, who will you now now be privy to her wrath and that of you know her sexy sexy ways. You know, um, those who fall in love with the spirit. Will be forever chasing that initial high that they get mm. from their first, you know, fun and frisky encounter. It's no different than a, a bad drug that mm -hmm. um, you know you're just never going to get that again because, like the drug itself, it's not there to give you that experience. That was just used to uh, draw you in, and you know, make no mistakes about it. You're involved with this spirit. Things are going to go from bad to worse, regardless of your actions or your behavior. It doesn't have anything to do with you, you know? You can. It's always going to come down to, well, things would be better if you tried harder, if you listened more, if you were more understanding, if you took better care of yourself, if you dressed nicer, uh, if you think of me once in a while. You know, it's just, I mean, but people in that trap initially, they, they, don't, they don't realize that, do they? They're, they're, they're in that trap, and they're just trying to do whatever they can to ameliorate whatever problem's been falsely or bogusly generated and then they're just they're on that hamster wheel constantly running around it and not resolving anything uh, absolutely it will suck the life of you i mean this spirit wants 
wants to control you. There's no way to please someone that is not interested in you. You know, in order to, they, they don't, they don't want to work on anything. They don't want to work anything out. The goal here is for them to cause their victim to self-destruct. You know, and, and that's why this spirit is known as the Black Widow Spider. For you know, as we know, Black Widow spiders uh, kill their mates and controlling a person through lust or fear or intimidation. It's absolutely a form of uh, witchcraft, you know, and and uh, that's why this spirit is really one of the shrewdest and sharpest uh, of demons. You know, the person control will cease to to have freedom. I mean, they will stop expressing themselves and their opinions because they're going to be laughed at or ridiculed for having those uh, opinions. You know, they they really will turn into. Uh, I mean, it's very sad to see. This happened to a man, but they will turn into a, sh- a they, shell of who they used to be. You they know? can't even be themselves um, anymore. They can't act like what they want to act like. So then they end up having to become fake. And then suddenly they've lost all sight of who they were and what they enjoyed, what they liked doing, because everything was ridiculed and diminished. And then suddenly, you know, they can't enjoy whatever they want to do because the other, the, the narc jazz is ri- constantly ridiculing the thing they enjoy because they're jealous of that thing that the person enjoys. They're jealous that the person even has, you know, uh, I have a friend who this older gentleman moved in um, in his neighborhood, and uh, this gentleman makes wonderful, you know, uh, Bloody Marys or something, so he, he was, you know, a man on his own, and he would make these Bloody Marys, and uh, I guess he had a couple dollars, so these people would go to his house and have these Bloody Marys, and one of the ladies that started going there was uh, another neighbor who uh, had always been looking for someone to kind of help her out financially. And she, you know, the, my friend who witnesses said, wow, you should see her. She's dressing up. She's cleaning up after everyone that's over there. So she came in looking like this wonderful helper. You know, she looked good. And she uh, she helped him become even better, an even better host, which is what this man wanted. Ultimately, he wanted to have people over at 5 o'clock to have these bloody men. And people uh, found a refuge in his home, and a, a, a wonderful little community was built around this because other lonely people or you know, people that, that we need community were drawn to this, and it became a little social hub. So he married her, and uh, very I, I, I don't even think it was a week later, she immediately decided that this was no longer appropriate, that he didn't need everyone over there, wow. that he had her and therefore should be perfectly happy with just that. And, um, you know, a year later when I went to visit this friend and ran into this couple, the man could barely drag his body around. He had gained all kinds of weight. He looked dejected. Oh. I, he was afraid to even talk to my friend. He used to be, you know, someone that he was close to at one time. Because of the because jealousy. That. And when we saw her, she no longer was this charming woman that she had been. Uh, you know, she 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 was a slob. She didn't dress like she used to, to when she was courting him. And your heart really went out because to him, because this man is. I mean, he's an older man, and I. He's done for, you know. Well, that's he, a that's a done. that's a good segue into the idea that the Jezebel narcissist loves to isolate. Yes, yes. Well, any controlling person spirit is all about uh, isolating the person that they're uh, killing. You know, that they're, right. I mean, I laugh, but it's really nothing funny. Uh, and I, I cannot stress enough to, um, you know, my heart goes out particularly to the men because I've devastated quite a few of their lives. And like I said, I've seen the lives of people I love, like my father, be uh, devastated. Um, this spirit will use, you know, they, um, you know, as a mother, it's, it's, they will use their own children uh, uh, as tools to manipulate and to advance her goal. Right. Uh, she knows how to use deep emotional hurts to further manipulate and control the family, you know? Right. So, um, give, an, give an example of that. I'm sorry? Could you give an example of that? Like how a mother would use a child? Uh, yeah, I'll use a personal example. <laughs> 
I, my parents separated. I needed uh, some kind of surgery. And uh, my Jezebel contacted my father and uh, told him to, you know, that she, she was going to be needing some help financially. Uh, he said he would be happy to help her, but all he wanted was to, to spend some time with me. And she said, great, you know, I'll meet you at the airport. You bring the funds, and I'll tell you where she's at. And, uh, you know, he was given, he brought the funds, and he was given bogus information. Oh. Oh, man. I mean, I never knew this until years, years later, when uh, he and I had an opportunity to speak, you know. So that was information withheld from me. Wow. Um. And it, of course, devastated him, and then he had no way of, you know, reaching anyone or being, had to leave the state. So that's, um, you know, that's a personal experience. I know who a mother is, but we'll stick with that, you know. Well, that's a good uh, enough one right there, that the, the using using you to get the money and then and then the heartlessness of not allowing a father to see his daughter. I mean, that takes that takes such an absolute amount of callousness and no conscience i mean to the nth degree to 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 think that you could do that to the father and and not just basically destroy him on the inside well they have no empathy you know you said heartless you know in order to be heartless i think you have to have a heart and uh they they don't have empathy that's why they do so many things to give the appearance that they do. Uh, a lot of these spirits like to go to church, believe it or not. They're very fond of that. It makes them look like a good church-going person. They love their gifts and grand gifts. But, you know, again, that's another form of, you know, control. Now you owe me kind of thing, you know. They are the first to volunteer for just about anything and everything. They you know, charity events. I, I think there's more Jezebel spirits at charity events than and, and anything else, especially the big kind where they can have parties and dress up and, again, you know, uh, impress and stuff, you know. It they does, like it, to be the center of attention. They love to be the center of attention. This is a good way to recognize, actually. It builds their image. Is, I'm sorry? It builds their image. To to go to be the one that's you know doing stuff at charity events they they they've built this false image of themselves and so yes. it helps to pad yes. that. Oh yes, yes, exactly. And then when you dare to turn around and to say, you know, you're 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 mean and hard. Oh me? No one gives more to charity. No one you know gives more to this or that. You know, it it it, it, it again. It, comes back to making you look like what you know that what's wrong with you you know well what did you do i host this party and i went to this event you know jill what happens to the person that actually confronts the narcissist jezebel and tells him her about herself and the person that can actually see through that that narc jez what ends up happening to that person It is so severe. I, I, I just when I used to go, you know, go to conventional therapy before it was pointed out to me that I was working, you know, on a, I mean, this was spiritual warfare. What my therapist would say to do is to try and stick to the point because they're not going to stick that and to just keep saying again and again, this is about this, this is not about that, this is not about this, this is not about that. The few times that I have attempted this on my own, or that others, when I used to be a Jezebel, attempted it. Um, okay, from someone who uh, uh, tried to do this, you are attacked on a scale that is unreal. You will basically every tactic will be used until you shut up and go away. It might start with, uh, you know, innocent of like, well, oh, stop it. You know, that's not me. That's just silly. Uh, and then it will go into, well, let me tell you why I did that. Because you did this last year. And 10 years ago, you had the nerve to do this and this and that. I mean, you know, it's just going to be all over the place because the goal here is to distract you. And now 
now you're talking about something that happened 10 years ago. Well, I wouldn't have done that as you're not, you know, is it, uh, you'll go there. If that doesn't work, uh, there will be uh, screaming. Uh, ultimately, I think what they use are tears to, mm. you know, which, which is usually how my Jezebel got everyone to back off, you know. Uh. They will fall apart and you are just going to feel horrible for having reduced them to this level, you know, like, what do you do? Why do I have to go? Ah! Right, as if you're and the I one to blame them. for their actions. People, you know, we love the person that's inside of them. We don't want to cause them that kind of pain, you know. Right, as if you're the but, one to blame for their actions. If you're to blame, well, of course I'm, it's your fault. Yeah. Their fault. Right. No, right. I, I, get used to that now. You will never, and if you are, you might not be going out with a Jezebel. You know, if that person can actually say, sincerely say, um, I take credit, I, I, I take responsibility for these, my actions in this, in this, you know, situation, I behaved uh, abominably. I, I was wrong, and I am really sorry, you know, I'm really going to, to pray on this, or talk to my therapist, whatever it is they do. Uh, you might not be, you, you, but in my experience, and like I said, having been, uh, when I was a young Jezebel, and, um, you know, dated men who dared to something it was just an instinct i never thought about it and i think that's part of it is you never think about it mm. you know like you're the, how dare you you just attack and that comes from not having any peace you know and like, the spirit is very proud and it's vain and um they're not going to put up with being around the, look at the friends of a jezebel uh, they're not going to have any friends that challenge them or have different points of views. Right. And if they do, those people would be quickly out of their lives. You know, like, oh, that person was just not right for me. I don't know what I was thinking. If that person dares to stand up and say, hey, look, you know, I think you're being a little hard on your husband or your children or whatever, that person is not going to be their friend. The only friends that they're going to have, quote, unquote, friends, are people who... Um, you know, we'll commiserate with them. And, but then, you know, it's horrible that your husband treats you like that, that type of thing, you know. How do you think spiritual warfare plays into all this? What what role does it take? That you're dealing, well, if you don't know anything about it, if you're not aware that you're dealing with a demonic presence. Then there's no way to win, right? I mean, you, if you can't fight what you don't know. But how did how did spiritual warfare help you? Well, to begin with, it uh, on a personal level, for the first time, I I, I I was even allowed to entertain the thought that I was not uh, some victim. I was not evil. I wasn't at the circums, you know, the hands of, of this person or that person that, um, that through a series of events that I had no control over, I had unwillingly and unsuspectedly allowed a certain force, demonic force, to enter my life and then by collaborating with it, you know, you, you create a world. I mean, if, if two people collaborate, if any, anyone who collaborates with another, you're going to create a, a given environment. And if you're collaborating with the devil, you know, things are never going to work out for you. They might temporarily, because that's the great deception, you know, the, the, the devil tells you, tells you a tiny bit of truth to sell you a big lie. For me, and we're talking about a good, solid, almost three decades of, um, to, you know, uh, always, I, I, I would try to, 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 to make, this is the time, you know, now I'm going to do it right. I'm going to get off this drug and I'm going to stop seeing these people and things are going to work out. And before you know it, I, I have attracted some other people into my life and they turned out to, 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 to be 
how people with their own agendas that had nothing to do with uh, working with me in a nice way that, that, you know, we're here to rob, uh, getting robbed, uh, a series of one bad event, uh, you know, I used to call it bad luck. You think, why do I have such bad luck? Why don't things work out for me? And just when it seems like they were going to work out, they'd never work out. You carefully construct something and build something just to see it fall apart. But what and happened then, in your life that you suddenly, I mean, I know you talked about going into the New Age movement, but how did you come across Jesus Christ? Um, basically, it was because of, of this kind of, you know, suffering, you know, I just, it, it, I, it, for me, because I, I'm so vigilant with, with, you know, when I do things, and I, and I was, I was doing my affirmations, and, you know, with the New Age movement, which, you know, was, a, like I said, it's a natural, it, Jezebel is very, very comfortable there, and I just was not seeing any changes in my life, as a matter of fact, Things were getting worse, especially on a supernatural level. My dreams were becoming these horrific uh, beds of iniquity where I was partaking in sexual acts that in my I would never want to be part of, you know. And um, I, I, at that particular time, I had been looking for employment. And I just was, I, 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 I think I've been a really good person at some point in the past. You know, I've had good jobs, but I was meeting with people who were coming up with the most outrageous schemes. And I would go to something that said, oh, you know, this is uh, an administrative position, a receptionist. And I'd get there, and the person would be like, you know, yeah, that's what it is. But at the same time, you know, I, I have, I, I, I should porn in my home, so I'd really want you to be present for that and make sure that, you know, the people behave right. So it just kept coming up. It just... Like, what are the odds? I'm going for this particular job now. I'm on a, you know, on a porn shoot. You know, you're not partaking in it. It just kept going on and on. And then I was man, I was seeing things. Uh, all of these. Um, at that particular time, I was praying to different uh, angels that don't exist. You know, like that day was uh, Archangel Metatron Day. Uh, in my sleep, I would see animal heads and things. You know, in my in my home in corners manifest and, and it was just starting to get very scary and uh, I, I I was driving around, I was praying to Metatron, a cat runs in front of the road and this other car swerves, misses me, hits the cat and I, I came home and I, I just got on my knees and I said this cannot, a person cannot go out, you know, to grocery shopping and, and, and there's three car wrecks that they barely avoid and cats are dying in front of them and, you know, it just can't happen. And um, I got on my knees and I, I, now I had been praying to Jesus and God, but I had just been including them along many others. And that particular day, I said, um, I need to know the truth because I'm obviously being deceived. I need to know who is really there for me. Wow. And I prayed to all of them, and Jesus was the one who showed up for me. Wow. Praise Jesus God. Showed yeah, yeah. And I and believe me, and I want to say this to a lot of people, I'm sorry, Jesus, to say this. I was not amused at first. I was one of these people that looked really down on Christians. I thought they, they, were, they were stupid. Um, I thought they were misinformed. I thought that, you know, um, I felt sorry for them. I did mere word itself just braided me as it does to a Jezebel, you know, it, it, it. it's not something that you want to be around. I, and I, and I've even contacted a couple of people that I had known that I treat them badly because they had been Christian. You know? Praise God though. What a blessing for them for you to do that. To, yeah. to see yeah, that the, but, what, you know, the results for me were immediate. You know, uh, it happened very, very fast. Actually, I have um, very, very soon after this happened to me, I wrote a prayer. I don't know when it's a good time for me to say this, but it's a great prayer for Jezebel to work with that was written, uh, you know, because I, I said, well, if I've been co-creating with the devil, I want to co-create with Jesus. And one of the first things that I did was sit and write this uh, 
this prayer that I just would, you know, repentance prayer that I would say over and over. But the results were amazing. They were very, very quick. Read you. Do you have the prayer with you? Can you read us the prayer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Now, you know, you can take this and, and make it your own. But like I said, this is, this is what I would do every every morning. And sometimes, you know, two or three times a day. But get on my knees and I would say, Father, I acknowledge that I have yielded myself to the spirit of Jezebel. I come to you now and ask you to forgive my wanton and whorish ways. I am sorry for the pain I inflicted upon others and for the harm that I have done to my mind and my body and my soul. I wish to walk in your standard of righteousness and goodness. I ask you to forgive me for my having tolerated the Jezebel spirit and for having been sympathetic to its ways. Help me to be ruthless and to eat and reject every type of temptation and manipulation associated with the spirit. I renounce and bind this demon of Jezebel, and I pull down its stronghold in my life, casting it to be abyss in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Show me how to properly plan in my body so that the Holy Spirit can inhabit it now and be forever in me. Guide me, dear God. Let me clearly hear your voice, and I promise to honor and follow your commands and your commands only. For I love and worship you, dear God. Blessed be the name of our Lord. Thank you for delivering me, Lord Jesus. I am and will forever remain your faithful servant, both with humility, obedience, and gratitude. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What an amazing prayer. Saints that are watching and other people that are watching that don't yet believe, people that are struggling with sin, I mean, that's that's all God's looking for. He's looking for a broken and contrite spirit. He knows we have weaknesses. He knows, as the scriptures say, he knows that we are but flesh. He knows what the enemy's been trying to do to all of us to draw us into sin, to draw us to be Jezebels and narcissists. He knows what we're dealing with, but his heart of compassion for people that will just do what Jill did, that is, just repent, just repent, just be sorry, and ask God, for his help to change you because you can't change on your own. You, you need, you need God to change you and to help you become born again. And once you're born again, you can do as Jill and, and many others have done when we've been born again. You can start to see things clearly. You can see your own behavior clearly. You can see the behavior of others in your life clearly. You can start to walk that straight and narrow path that Jesus spoke of and find freedom and find life. And that's what's at the end of a, of a prayer like that. That prayer probably took her less than a minute to pray, but it changed her whole life. And your life can be changed too with a similar prayer. So this is a good time to conclude this segment of the interview. And I know we'll take this interview up again at a later date because there's so much more to glean from it. But we'll just go ahead and conclude with prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this interview with Jill and how transparent she was and and how knowledgeable she was of this evil spirit that we that we deal with and that we're dealing with, that each one of us is dealing with. And I just praise you and thank you for just, you taught us so much today through this interview. I, I mean, I, I feel like a different person, and I pray that everybody that heard this today will leave this interview different and able to recognize the spirit that spirits that they're dealing with and also to see in Jill's testimony Particular in that prayer, there was warfare in that prayer. There was a commanding of that spirit to leave her and have no part of her again. And that's why she's walking in freedom. And so I encourage each and every believer that's listening to this, and I ask you, Father God, to help them, each and every believer, to take up their weapons of their warfare, which is the Word of God, and to speak to these demons in their lives, to bind them, speak to them, and tell them to leave, and to do it audibly. And I just praise you and thank you that your deliverance is there. And Father God, one last thing, she mentioned her involvement in the New Age and witchcraft. And I just praise you right now for just encouraging everyone that's been involved in witchcraft or in the New Age on any level to repent just as Jill did and to seek your forgiveness and to get deliverance from that as well because that's a big part of the stronghold that demons uh, will take in our lives is through witchcraft. So Father, I just come against all spirits of witchcraft operating against each and every listener and the people they're praying for. We bind it up, rebuke it, and command it to leave those people, and we lose freedom and obedience because 
Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and its place we loose in the mighty name of Jesus. So obedience to you and your word. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father God. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And Jill, I just thank you so much for this interview. It was ridiculously informative. It was um, amazing what the journey you brought us on. And I just, I pray that you'll come on the podcast again because there's a lot more to break down and discuss in the days to come. I certainly, you know, told, told God that after, after he did what he did for me. And uh, I said, well, you know, why, why did I have to go through all this? And that is what I got, you know, was that I'll be able to help those that are in the snares. And I have completely given myself over to that. And uh, I do Great hope so. that I've helped people. And I hope that I've imposed upon them how um, dangerous this situation is and that, um, it, you know, to see the fruits in their life and, and, and to to see their their uh, their lives turn into something beautiful that they're going to appreciate and enjoy and enhance the lives of others. You, you cannot you cannot be attached to these uh, spirits. Well, before yeah. we break away, I want to ask you that: What's your life like now? <laughs> You've got two minutes. <laughs> I never dared to think or dream that, uh, first of all, and, and it, like I said, the inner peace that I that I could wake up and and um, you know experience that that in itself is huge. The people that I'm coming into contact with are genuinely kind, the loving people that I'm for the first time having real friendships and and uh, relationships with. Uh, I barely have to think about something, and then a series of events will come together to manifest it, you know, uh, but on, on projects that I'm working on, and um, it's, it's, it's very easy, there's great ease, um, but, you know, make no mistakes about it, the warfare only begins type of thing. Yeah, you know it continues, I mean? right? Throughout your life, it continues, but at least you have the joy and the peace that you're talking about, the fruit of the Spirit to enable you to continue through each and every tribulation. Like Jesus said, um, fear not, he's overcome the world and and we can follow in his footsteps. Well, and to have Jesus by your side and to have, you know, God, to know that God is your father. There's, there's, I I can't imagine, you know, a greater um, gift than that, to just be able to turn to him at any moment. And say, I, I need your, I, I need your help right now. Can you please guide me? You know, can you advise me? And it, it, it it's instantaneous. Um, you know, anything from things I've heard it from, from trapping. I mean, it's everything, everything. You know, there's a tremendous ease. There's grace, which was something I've never known. Uh, and most importantly, and I think this was huge. You, you actually feel for people. You actually feel love, which at first can be a little overwhelming because we, that's how courageous so, you know, the most so successful. It cuts us off from that. We don't. That's why they can treat people and themselves that way because they they have been uh, that spirit. I, I believe you know, sucks the love, the love out of you. So you don't you don't have it for yourself, and you can't give it to others. So feeling for other people was something that I, I that was new to me. That means I have to ask one more. I have to ask you one more question now, because of that. What was that difference like? Where all of a sudden you actually wanted to help people instead of maybe use them? What was that like? You know, sometimes when you are the one going through the experience, it doesn't. It's not as obvious as to one who's witnessing it. And right. I have a very dear friend who actually um, had, you know, what called me up recently and had a dream that I had reverted back to that of me, uh, which was, you know, very painful for him. So for me, it just, when you're going through it, it's, you know, all of a sudden you just, well, you know, I'm doing this, but this is who I am and that's who I was. So it's not as obvious. I think that's it's more right. obvious to to the people around you who are all of a sudden um, surprised that they can actually reach out to you and you're available and you show up. Uh, 
I think that's where it comes in, you know, for me, you know, to, right. to the other people, like, I'll just show up and do something, and I'll look at their faces and see this complete shock, like, really, you're here helping me with this? And I'll be like, well, yeah, why not? Why wouldn't I be? <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're so born again, you forgot who you used to be. That's, and that's, the, that's the blessing of it. Exactly, yeah, that's well, well said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank you for the work you're doing. You know, it certainly uh, helped me realize something. And uh, hopefully we can impress upon people the importance of walking with, you know, with God. And, and, and let them reap the benefits of doing so. You know, uh, just to experience what life is like without this this monkey on your back, which is more than that, you know, that's actually a good way to put it, but really, really finding your own strength and, and, uh, and experiencing life, you know, beautiful, sincere, but there's nothing, there's nothing, I mean, that's why we're here, isn't it? Yeah. You co-create with, you know, with, with, with God and... It's amazing how when you when you get born again, how differently you look at just nature. How you, you're outside and you're looking at this tree and you're just like, this tree is so amazing, and you you just get so much joy out of the simple what what appears to the narcissist or the Jezebel to seem mundane or boring. You get joy out of it, but really, the narcissist Jezebel's got it upside down, and it's the way they feel is not right. It's not that the way we feel is wrong. The way we feel is right. We're supposed to get that kind of enjoyment out of God's creation and to, you know, see him in it. And uh, they, they, they couldn't but, enjoy that. And that's just, that's just one of many, many benefits you know, of knowing God. You can't manipulate the tree, so why, why would you want to set up with, I mean, you might want to have a picture up against it, you know, right. to show everyone how great your outfit looks like, you know, picture up with the tree, but why not? Right. You know, the, the, the tree's, tree's not, tree not tree the, the narc. <laughs> The tree yeah, isn't so the narcissist, so it can't yeah. be appreciated. She's jealous of the beautiful yeah. tree. <laughs> well, Jill, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much again for for the interview, and let's do it again. Yeah, I'm happy to. I appreciate it. All right. We hope you enjoyed the interview, and hope you'll stop in again for future interviews. And be blessed, everyone, in Jesus' name. Amen. His name is Jesus, Savior of